Okay, in this lecture we're going to talk about grading and evaluation. Um, so we're starting our last module, yay! And we're really be discussing the evaluation piece of our class. And we'll first start off talking about grading and evaluation. So what does this mean in the classroom and in classroom context? So we'll start off with what's the difference between assessment and evaluation? I know you guys are like, oh my god, that was the beginning of the semester. Oh, Dr. Wilson, really? So assessment where is this continuous scrapbook of information is ongoing. It's measuring performance to provide feedback or to make instructional and changes. Whereas evaluation is tends to be either limited or ongoing. It's a snapshot where we're making a judgment. So we're going to remember assessment is that big overarching term, the whole class. And when we're talking about evaluation, we're really talking about that judgment. So we're talking about um, evaluation today of students and specifically how do we grade and how do we grade for the nine weeks? How do we put a grade on that report card at the end of the day? So when we talk about that, um, we'll talk about different grading schemes and for the grading plan, we'll talk about the end of this lecture, you're really going to be thinking about um, coming up with a grading plan for yourself. So letter grade. So what are some advantages? Um, I think about a letter grade, it's that A through F kind of idea. Um, although um, G apparently was also used, so below an F would be a G. So maybe we can be thankful that that's no longer a thing. Um, and we can have plus or minus, so we can have an A plus or an A minus, depending on the school system. So what are some advantages and disadvantages of a letter grade? Um, advantages are that it's um, pretty universally understood in the United States. Um, and that it's a nice classification system, so it's kind of broad in general. Um, but the disadvantages would be that um, it is broad in general, so it doesn't give us those nuances. So um, if you score anywhere in between, you know, a 90 and a 99, you get an A. But that doesn't, you know, there could be really large differences between a student who scored a 90 and a 99. And then again, a student who got an 89, we get a B. And so it would make it really seem like there was a big difference between that student with a 90 and that student with an 80-90, but there really, really might not have been a big difference, right? So that it can lead to, yeah, some misunderstandings. Um, the way that percentage correct or the number grades, we have, you know, 0 to 100. Advantages and disadvantages, right? So the advantages would be that it is a little more exact, a little more nuanced. So we can think about, oh, like, um, like, like I can really make those distinctions between a 94 and a 96, right? Um, but that can also be a disadvantage because it might give us a false sense of um, accuracy. So is there really a meaningful difference between that 94 and that 95? And there might not be, especially when we, when we consider error in measurement and that our grades are not without error, right? Um, but they're pretty um, universally understood by parents, by teachers, by students. We can also use a rubric or a checklist um, with specific criterion. So here's an example of a rubric. Again, um, as an overall grading scheme, it's not very common that we use this um, for K through 12, although we oftentimes see some sort of rubric or checklist for pre-K. So here's kind of an example of what that might look like here. Um, and here we have the S and N and U's. So satisfactory, he met it or he didn't and N. Um, and you can kind of see how the teacher combined this. Here's specific skills we're working on along with a narrative that the teacher has um, given about the student, Jared. Um, here's another, and this one is about standards. So standards-based assessment would be, here's a list of the standards that are, um, that are being taught, and then we could evaluate the student on each standard. Um, so some advantages and disadvantages. Um, Advantages are it's completely tied directly to the standards that we're assessing for a grade level. Um, the disadvantages would be that that could be really long. So it could be a really long set of standards, and not all those standards are written in a way that are easily comprehended by parents or by students. So it could lead to greater misunderstandings. Um, if this is more common in the early grades. Um, in the primary grades is less common in later grades. Um, we could also have a pass-fail. So um, either you pass the class or you don't. Um, we are piloting this um, in some of the internship classes. Um, it's common in things like driver's ed. Either you can drive or you should not be on the roads. Um, some advantages or disadvantages. Um, it makes sense for things where there wouldn't be a qualitative difference. Um, <laughs> we talked about a portfolio. 
um, already this semester, and we could have our entire evaluation system be about this portfolio rather than about a grade at the end with more qualitative feedback. Oftentimes we combine this portfolio with a written description where a teacher would write a detailed description of the work that's individualized, hopefully um, based upon a set of standards or a set of expectations. Um, the disadvantage of something like a written description in a portfolio is that it really depends upon the expertise of the teacher. So if a teacher is an expert and knows what is expected at grade level and what need what a student might need to work on and grow, it can be really rich and deep information. If you have a brand new teacher, a teacher who's less certain, um, that information provided might not be as helpful. Um, and again, um, it, it's really open to interpretations. So we see less reliability with this type of information. Um, so let's talk a little bit about grading policies. Um, the first question is, does being fair to all students mean that all students get the same thing? Hopefully you guys have been asked this question a lot in your experiences and you're all saying no, no, of course not, that, that equality and equity are not the same thing, right? Um, but how do we, and we believe this about instruction, right? We believe that we need to instruct students in different ways, but then when it comes to assessment, if we're giving students different assignments, how do we give them a grade? Because to some extent, the grades have to be fair across the board, right? Especially as we're considering how people are compared to each other, right? In high school, we rank students by their grades. And so if we're giving students some students easier assignments and some students harder assignments, how do we account for that? But at the end of the day, they're going to be compared on that same scale. So here's a question for you. In your seventh grade social studies class, report card grades were based on quizzes, tests, and out of class project, which counted 25% of the grade. Terry obtained an A average on his quizzes and tests, but has not turned in his project despite frequent reminders. What do you do? So, um, this is a little bit difficult to give as a, as a, um, lecture to, uh, to nobody here or to, you know, cyberspace. But some things we might want to think about, right? Um, in this is that why didn't Terry complete the out-of-class project? Um, I gave him reminders. Um, if there was a difference in socioeconomic status, maybe um, Terry's homeless. Should I still assess his work? Um, was that a project um, assessing the same standards as his um, quizzes and tests? If it was, and he's already demonstrated mastery on the quizzes and tests, um, what does my grade mean in the class? Maybe he deserves an A because he's already demonstrated mastery. Or maybe that project is assessing something different, some other set of skills, and so he shouldn't deserve an A. Maybe he deserves a C, which would be a zero average with the A, right? So just really thinking about what would your policy be? And I mean, the short answer is I probably shouldn't have had a completely out-of-class project, right? I should be able to have something that Terry could turn in. Um, you're a biology teacher of a high school class, which consists of students with varying abilities. For this class, you give two exams as you complete compute grades from Bernie. Um, got a B on the first exam and an A on the second exam. What should this grade be? Most of yours first instinct should be, well, let's just average them together. So it's like a B plus A minus, right? What if the second exam was um, cumulative? So it covered everything that the first exam covered. Should you get an A? See, improved. Are we going to incorporate improvement into this? Is there a way that it could do better? What if this first exam was an F and the second exam was an A? Is there a way that we could improve if you start off with failing, how are we going to allow students to recover from that, right, to improve their grades? I mean, again, the short answer is we shouldn't have an entire grade based upon two, just two tests, right? We should have other kinds of daily work, homework, projects, right? But I also want you to think about distilling this kind of information and really thinking about what does a grade in your class mean? Um, should effort and improvement be included in grades? And Popham does a really nice discussion of these two things. Um, if we're going to include effort, how do we um, operationalize that? And that's the main problem with including effort is that we can't really grade effort because we don't really know what it means. And the other problem with effort is, right, some kids put in a lot of effort, but they never really master the content, which is really probably what we're supposed to be measuring in class, right? And the other part of it is, some kids came in knowing the content already, right? They are, they came into your class already knowing everything that you were going to teach them. And so they don't have to put in that much effort. Should they be counted off because they already knew? That doesn't seem fair either, right? Improvements may be another story, and but also something to think about ahead of time before you start 
um, the instruction before you start. You want to think about your writing policy. Um, if you have a student and who begins off really poorly, you want to be able to account for improvement in their grade. You don't want them to fail at the beginning and have no way to recover from that, right? Because then what's their motivation for trying in class at all, right? At the same time, you want to give them motivation to try in the beginning. If you reward improvement too much, then in the beginning there's no reason for them to try at all, right? Um, should student participation be included in the grade? And I know in all of your classes you're like, student participation, 25 points, 10 points, whatever. How do you account for that, right? Um, some different ways teachers have done this, right? They've maybe counted the number of times you raised your hand or you spoke in class. And I think sometimes that has, excuse me, unintended consequences, right? Have you been in a class where people just say inane things just to contribute or like on discussion boards? Um, hopefully not in this class where people just say, um, yes, I agree with her. So they get participation points for being a part of the discussion when they're not really adding meaningful things to that discussion. And again, you know, participation in something like PE, right? So a lot of times that just means like um, putting on your clothes for PE, right? That's not really participating. I mean, I think by high school, we're all really capable of changing clothes, right? So maybe participation in a physical education class should include like actually doing some workouts, right? So really thinking about, and, and depending on the class, right, what participation is, you would think participation in a theater class or in a dance class or a PE class would be really important. But what does participation look like in a math or a science class? And that might be a different thing. Maybe participation is really things like doing your homework, right, or doing your classwork. Um, the next one is, what should I do if most students fail the test? Now, I know we know instructionally, if everyone fails the test, we're going to reteach and probably give the test again. But what are we going to do with the grades? Right? And there's a couple of different options teachers have done. I mean, one thing would be to just um, erase that test grade completely from the grade book. But is that fair to the students who actually did well on that test? Maybe not. Another way would be to allow students to retake the test if they want to. Um, one downside would be that some students might actually do worse on the second try, or they, um, yeah. Um, or they could do better than some of the kids who chose not to. It could get confusing. Um, one thing that a te some teachers do is that they make students do a series of work before they can retake the test. They have to demonstrate that they're ready to retake the test. That way they improve their scores. Um, another thing they can do is maybe, like in this class, you can um, make up points on a test or on a quiz by demonstrating the correct answer and explaining the correct answer for partial credit. So there's lots of ways we can kind of do test recovery to see if they can um, improve and demonstrate understandings. You just want to think about how you can develop a policy ahead of time. Um, a really important question for you to consider is what should failure mean in your class? And honestly, what I mean by that is failure should be failure to master the content. A student shouldn't fail your class because that they just didn't do the work. It should really represent a failure to understand the material. If they know the material, but they didn't do the classwork, there's maybe something else going on. And if they didn't do enough of the work, so you don't know if they do it or they know it or don't know it, and that's another issue. But you don't want to fail a student because they like didn't do their homework, especially if they were doing well on the test. And you want to think about ways in which you can make that work out with your class policies. Um, thinking really carefully about what components go into that final grade with tests, quizzes, um, projects, classwork, and how all those components work together, and what percentages each one's worth. Um, thinking about borderline cases, so 5 and 89, or I have a 69, maybe that's worse, like almost passing. How do I review those? And like, as a professor, trust me, I get lots of those emails every semester, 5 and 89, blah, 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 right? And it's a dilemma as a teacher, right? Is it fair? Is there enough measurement error in my own grading that I can trust that that 89 isn't really supposed to be a 90? And it's hard, right? You want to have a policy set ahead of time. Probably the worst thing is to, is to when a student emails you, be like, well, okay, I'll give you a 90. I'll give you an A now, right? Because now we're just rewarding students for like kind of being annoying and sending emails, and you don't necessarily want to do that, right? So for this, usually, um, 
I had to have some sort of metric. So maybe it comes down to how much you participated and that might push you one way or another. Maybe you offer extra credit activities that don't count towards the final grade, but instead help you review that borderline case. Um, you just want to have something that you're thinking about. Um, thinking about how does grading affect motivation? So if you give student a poor grade on something or if they earned a poor grade, um, how does that affect their motivation moving forward? Um, when I taught elementary art, which is a pretty subjective thing to grade, right? Um, I was really cognizant of how that might affect the way in which students viewed art. And I, um, I knew I had my students K through five and that a lot of them would never take another art class after they had me. Um, in elementary school, they would want to take music or theater in middle school and maybe never return to art, right? So I wanted them to leave their elementary experience loving art, right, and having an appreciation for the visual arts. So I um, I really didn't give poor grades <laughs> in elementary school if I could help it because I wanted them to be motivated and have good feelings, right? Um, and also, I mean, there weren't a lot of consequences to, you know, what my grade meant in my art class. That would be a really different thing than if I taught um, math in elementary school, right? Because that would actually indicate understanding of math concepts, and I wouldn't want someone to think that they understood second grade math if they didn't, right? And then move on to third grade math, right? So thinking about, but how does grading affect motivation? It's an important consideration. Um, then you want to think about cr cheating, right? So if we're really, if we really think that our grades assess understanding and we have a student who's cheating and what do we typically do when a student cheats we give them a zero right so now that zero on the test or on that assignment doesn't represent their level of understanding it represents the behavior and it's a negative consequence for the behavior so um, now our grade is representing something other than we're lowering the validity of that assessment right and that's a question about you kind of just have to consider how do you feel about this right and um Again, I'm not necessarily opposed to giving a zero for cheating. I, I take cheating very seriously. Um, but I want you to think about what it means, especially if it's the type of cheating where someone you let someone else cheat off of you, right? Because now our grade's not representing what they actually know. Um, again, thinking about fallibility and testing at appropriate levels. So let's talk a little bit about our grading plan that's due this week. Um, Again, your, your purpose here is to, is to help you think through your own evaluation plan for your students. Um, you're going to have a short introduction, paragraph with a rationale. The first question is the type of grading system you'll use. Now, obviously, when you go to teach in a school, they're going to tell you you have to use an A, you have to give a number grade, um, you won't have a choice. But I want you to tell me, in an ideal world, what would you use? Would you use a checklist? Would you use a standards-based system, a portfolio with written responses? Would you give a grade, a letter grade, or a number grade? Tell me. Then tell me, how would you incorporate the final grades? So are you going to use tests, projects, daily work? Tell me how you would come up with that final assessment and evaluation. And then tell me if you're going to hold a, a, a child back, if they're going to fail your class, or if they're going to be successful, how are you going to determine that? How will you measure success, right? Think through your answer on all of these, right? Um, then the next component is connection to your philosophy of teaching. This is different than your um, the ed psych theory that so we've done earlier in the class. This is really what you believe about teaching, what you believe about learners, right? So if you believe that learning is an ongoing developmental process, right? That's my philosophy then I might have an assessment policy that allows for a vision of work, right? Because that's that would be my policy that would reflect what I believe about learners, right? So really think about how the policies that you have in class, what you believe about success and failure, how that reflects in what you believe about learning and about education. Um, and then in conclusion, you don't have to have a reference list, but again, if you reference something, be sure that that's included in the APA format. And then again, here just quickly, um, as you're in class, kind of in, um, on your own activity here, go through and make sure that you can identify the pros and cons of each of these grading plans. If you can't, please email me, set up a time to talk. Um, I'd be happy to help go through these with you. And other than that, have a great week, and I look forward to reading your final projects and reflections this week. Bye.